Um, so over the course of the next 30 to 40 minutes, I will talk about this approach to inclusive excellence, but I'll be most interested in the opportunity for you know, some back and forth. So I'm gonna talk first about the importance of scientific, scientific workforce diversity. Uh, then I'm going to talk a bit about this role that I have as Chief Officer for Scientific Workforce Diversity. Although I was made the permanent COSWIT, as it's called, at the end of May, I was serving as the acting COSWIT since last October. So I've been in the position for a little more than a year and kind of in the beginning to get my feet on the ground. And yes, I will talk about the NIH Unite initiative. So we at NIH believe that it is really important that we get diverse perspectives in science. Um, the problems that we are addressing are monumental in biomedicine. And our attempts to solve those problems are kind of like uh, people with like outsight trying to describe an elephant. Um, so it's really important to come at it from a lot of different perspectives to try to get a sense of the true reality of things. Um, that's conceptually how one could look at it. What did the data show? Well, there's lots of data in the um, uh, business sector that suggests that um, having a diverse team leads to better organizational performance. For instance, when you have mock jury panels, uh, those that are more racially diverse uh, tended to make more uh, information informed and fact-based decisions than uh, less diverse panels. When you looked at socially diverse contexts uh, for making decisions uh, and taking into consideration the perspective of others, a more diverse group made better decisions than uh, a homogeneous group. And um, the data that I find most exciting and interesting is the one looking at ethnically diverse market traders uh, and finding that when you had a diverse group of traders, um, there was more return on the investment than when you had a more homogeneous group of uh, traders, kind of speaking to the concept of groupthink, sometimes taking in the wrong direction. But how does this translate in science? Well, there's the wonderful study by Freeman and Wong from 2015 that's looked at some 2.5 million uh, scientific papers uh, and tried to look at things relative to what they call the homophily index, how homogeneous the authors appear to be based upon last name and, and assumed ethnicity based upon name. Of course, that's not always an accurate marker, but pretty good. And they found that the more homogeneous, the higher the homophily index, the lower the impact factor, going all the way through to a very low homophily index and a much higher impact factor. Now, of course, you'll say, Marie, a 10 authored paper um, is looking at probably different science, perhaps, than a two authored paper. Um, but other ways that they looked at it in terms of geographic diversity, uh, based upon addresses of the authors in the paper, or information diversity based upon the number of references that were cited as they were building the paper, um, suggested that diversity was associated with a greater impact factor and greater percentile, or greater citations. Um, and there are lots of other um, data, uh, numbers of patents, uh, areas of focus of the science that would suggest that diverse teams leads, lead to better science. Above and beyond that, we know that there are changes ongoing in terms of the demographics of this country. Uh, the most recent 2020 census data just has fully reinforced that. And when you look at things like uh, who gets R1 equivalent grants from NIH versus uh, representation in the STEM workforce versus representation in the general population, you find that for non-Hispanic whites, this pretty good representation and things are fairly equivalent. For Asian Americans, um, there's very good representation in terms of the STEM workforce in the R01 uh, grant recipients. But when you look at the Hispanic or Latino population and when you look at the Black or African American population, there's a lot of opportunity to take advantage of more talent. And when you look at the professoriate, starting from the instructor level, going all the way through the department chair. At the instructor level, you have a fair number of underrepresented women, well-represented women, underrepresented men, well-represented men. Those numbers or those proportions go down progressively as you go through the professorate. I know I'm speaking to the choir. I know you're very aware of all of this. So what are we doing about this? Well, one of the things is this role that I'm currently serving in, that of the Chief Officer for Scientific Workforce Diversity. Dr. Hannah Valentine 
was the first Coswood. Um, she came into this role in 2014. She, in, she left at the end of uh, September of 2020, and that's when I stepped in as the acting Coswood. And in my role in this little more than a year, it's become very clear to me that uh, we need to pay attention to this acting proverb. Um, if you want to go fast, you go alone. And if you want to go far, you go together. We're a tiny office like this ant uh, with an apple that's probably 50 times bigger than this as our mission. Uh, but we're really pleased that we now have a lot of clearly identified uh, allies, particularly in this NIH Unite initiative that I'll be talking about shortly. Um, we are looking as we go forward to a uh, clear mission of leading the science of scientific workforce diversity. We work across NIH and beyond to foster diversity, equity, and inclusion to enhance creativity and innovation of science. Uh, our goal is to be the NIH thought leader in creating cultures of inclusive excellence, allowing NIH and NIH funded institutions to benefit from a full range of talent. How do we do this? We do this by building the evidence using NIH many times as our test bed, by disseminating the evidence, working through the full scientific community from trainees to established and tenured scientists and acting on the evidence, piloting integrated institutional wide systems to address bias, faculty equity, mentoring and work-life issues. And as I go through, you'll see some examples of that very specifically in the Coswood office and at times as part of our partnering with NIH Unite. Uh, in fact, there's a lot of overlap between NIH Unite, which I co-chair. Uh, the NIH Unite initiative is to address systemic racism. It's stated actually on the website, structural racism, but that's a misnomer in my mind. Structural racism is the whole of what occurs in an ecosystem transportation, education, housing, et cetera. We don't have control over that, but we certainly have control over the systems in the biomedical research uh, enterprise that we fund and that we support, and that's what we're focusing on. That goal overlaps with the goal of the Cosmet Office to address the full diversity of the scientific workforce. Uh, what's the full diversity? We very much ascribe to the definition of diversity as put forward in the um, 2019 uh, notice from NIH uh, for uh, consideration for diversity supplements. So it includes individuals from racial and ethnic groups that have been shown to be underrepresented in health-related sciences by the National Science Foundation, but it also includes people with disabilities, individuals from disadvantaged backgrounds, whether it's socioeconomically deprived, rural, whatever, um, LGBTQI plus individuals, women at the graduate level and beyond. It's a wide variety of individuals. Um, again, trying to bring those diverse perspectives and personal experiences to the table when thinking about complex scientific problems. Some of the wonderful achievements of this office have been things like leading um, within NIH a climate survey to determine uh, the presence of um, harassment for our staff in 2018 and leading to changes in policy at NIH. Uh, leading three COVID impact surveys, one the summer of 2020 that was for NIH staff uh, and one in the fall of uh, 2020 that looked at leaders of um, associate vice presidents for research and equivalent across uh, the country and individual researchers. We have data from about 45,000 plus individual researchers. We hope to actually get that manuscript submitted very soon um, for peer review and publication. There are also programs like the Future Leaders Research Program, the Senior Scholars Program, that are internal programs to enhance diversity at NIH. Um, there's the Diversity Program Consortium led by the National Institute of General Medical Sciences, but supported by our office, and the Faculty Institutional Recruitment for Sustainable Transformation Program that is for the broad uh, um, extramural research community, and I'll talk a little bit more about that as well. And we have products like a tool to help with searches. We have a blog that you've gotten pretty aggressive in trying to get published. Um, if you're not subscribed, please do take a look at diversity.nih.gov. We also uh, have of late started trying to work on disseminating information about uh, the science of scientific workforce uh, diversity, trying to keep it front of mind. For instance, we had the first of what we call the SWDSS, Scientific Workforce Diversity Seminar Series, just at the end of September. The title was, Is Implicit Bias Training 
effective with this group of outside panelists and we had a couple of inside NIH staff as reactants. We were really excited and had more than 900 people to participate in this first seminar or to listen into this first seminar. Much of it probably motivated by the fact that there is now mandatory implicit bias training for all 47,000 NIH staff, but a good 40% of the participants in this were from outside of the NIH. So clearly there was an interest and a hunger for this sort of discussion, and there was no um, um, set agreement among the panelists about how this should play out. So it was a good academic discussion. Next week, uh, a week from today, in fact, we'll have a debrief from the National Academies of Science, Engineering, and Medicine on the workshop held in late June on uh, addressing uh, anti-racism in STEM. We were a big uh, supporter of the funding of this, and this is a report out of the outcomes uh, to allow uh, you know, a summary and begin thinking about what this means for the future. Um, so all are welcome to participate. We'd originally thought we'd only have this for NIHers, but it became clear that lots of people might be interested in this capsule summary. So if you go to diversity.nih.gov, um, you can find the registration for this event. And then we will be having another seminar December 8th on achieving equity in faculty hiring, the pros and cons of cohort recruitment to try to capture some of the thoughts and enthusiasm around the first uh, funding opportunity announcement and other similar programs. So that's very quickly some of the top level things that we're thinking about in the Cosmet office. Let me just elaborate a little bit about what's happening with NIH Unite. So the NIH Unite initiative was officially unveiled to the public on February 26th. Marie, what does cohort recruitment mean as opposed to regular recruitment? That means that you're bringing in a group of scientists at one time as opposed to individual recruitment. You're building a self-reinforcing network of individuals um, and you're making sure that they get extra support, extra mentoring to uh, allow them to be successful in their uh, academic careers. You're also taking a look at the environment, the culture, the institution to make sure that it's appropriately supportive and welcoming to those individuals. So, um, so how would that work, Maria, mechanically then? You would, I'm just trying to think through, you would invite 20 scientists um, to participate in a group discussion. And we don't need to get in, into terrific technical details. I'm just fascinated by the mechanism to bring yeah, we're scientists yeah. together. Some of my subsequent slides, slides allow for a little elaboration on that. So, okay. Um, I'll wait. I'll wait. Okay. So I want to talk about the NIH Unite initiative because it overlaps so much with what the COSWIT role is, but not fully. And because um, it has a lot of people aligned at NIH on the importance of making sure that we are fully inclusive and taking advantage of all of the talent that's out there. Uh, it was, as I said, unveiled officially at a, a special meeting of the advisory committee to the director on February 26, although we'd been working on it for a while. In fact, um, as a result of the events in the fall of 2020, and then the videotape murder of George Floyd, uh, we, along with others, uh, really took stock and felt that this was a time for us to do things differently. There were a series of intense institute and center directors to talk about initial uh, issues that were identified. And then some self-assembled groups, in particular a group called ACRE, Eight Concepts of Racial Equity came forward, relatively early career uh, staff. And they came with their data. They came with case studies to Francis Collins, NIH director, Larry Tabak, the principal deputy director, uh, demonstrating that the things that were being seen outside of NIH exist within NIH as well. Francis and Larry were very taken by these data and made sure that all the institute and center directors heard it. And it made it just very clear that you couldn't say that the problems of racism that we were seeing highlighted in the news didn't exist within our organization and that we really needed to do something about it. This was supported by input from the African-American and Black uh, tenured scientists, the Anti-Harassment Steering Committee, and we all came to a shared commitment to address structural racism. We felt we we're at a tipping point and at a moment that we cannot let pass. So what was unveiled was something called Unite, five interacting work streams, one to look at understanding stakeholder experiences, one for new research and health disparities, minority health and health equity research, 
one on improving our own internal culture and structure, getting our house in order and role model modeling for what we would expect of the outside world. Another to hold us to being accountable, uh, transparent and communicating what we've done. And a final work stream to look at the extramural research ecosystem. What sorts of changes in policy, culture and structure need to be done to achieve equity for all. So we said when we unveiled this, that this was gonna be a marathon, maybe even an ultra marathon. And we didn't know for sure what the mall markets would be along the way, but that we would be reporting out at each of the twice yearly advisory committee to the director meetings, um, talking about what we'd accomplished and what we anticipate go going forward for the next six months. So June 11th, as we reported out, we said, that on Friday, February 26, we would publicly commit to identifying and correcting any NIH policies or practices that may have helped to perpetuate structural racism. And sure enough, on that day, and then published that following Monday, March 1st, was the statement from Francis Collins to individuals in the biomedical research enterprise who may have endured disadvantages due to structural racism. Our advisory committee members were very pleased, uh, and many have been very grateful for Francis to Francis for acknowledging this. We also said that we would continue to aggressively implement approaches to address the Ginter Gap and enhance portfolio of diversity. What's the Ginter Gap? It's the 2011 science article published uh, by um, Donna Ginter, Raynard Kington, and others that demonstrated that there was a persistent disadvantage for African American and Black scientists in, in receipt of R1 equivalent grants from NIH. Um, when Hannah arrived in 2014, she began looking at the data from 2013. She did a report out to the advisory committee in 2018. And these 2020 data show that there is a trend to things getting better. Um, in 2013, you had uh, many fewer uh, African-American and Black scientists applying for R1s than in 2020. Uh, however, you cannot even see the bar for American Indian and Alaska Natives or for Native Hawaiian Pacific Islanders. The uh, numbers of Hispanic and Latino Africans were small relative representation in the general population. Um, and the numbers were, or the percentage or the success rates have gotten better, although there's still a gap and still the numbers are really, really small. So we have a lot of work still to do and we're committed to continuing to do that. We also said that we would launch a multi-tiered uh, and phased in, uh, common fund initiative focused on transformative health disparities research. Uh, amazingly to me, a month later, these RFAs were published. It usually takes forever to get an RFA published at NIH. And just uh, this past week, the first 11 awards were announced, um, six for the general transformative research, five for transformative research at minority serving institutions. And there'll be another competition for this RFA in fiscal year 22. We also said that we would ensure a robust NIH wide commitment to a then in development minority health institute uh, RFA on structural racism and discrimination, its impact on health disparities. Um, and less than a month later, that RFA was published with 25 institute and centers uh, committed to it. Uh, I understand there was a very robust response to the solicitation that closed on August 24th. As a bonus, and I'm sure you guys are very aware of this, um, there was a, a brain initiative, an IH-wide brain initiative funding opportunity announcement that was published that for the first time is taking into consideration plans to enhance diverse perspectives as part of the scoring criteria. Um, it's hoped that this will have a beneficial impact on making sure that there are more diverse perspectives being brought to the table and more diverse individuals involved in recruitment of subjects, et cetera. There are several other funding opportunity announcements that are looking to replicate this language and we will be evaluating the impact of all of this. And then Maria, we said- what are what were some examples of, of, of measures to increase diversity? What were the, just a few examples, not, not you know, in detail, but- yeah, some examples were, what are your plans to have diverse individuals among your trainees, among your team, um, in terms of the outreach that you're gonna be making if you are having human content? I mean, this was generated by the recognition by the People in the Brain Initiative that uh, much of the uh, biomaterial that they had to make their assessments came from very homogeneous groups. 
Um, and that when they stepped back and they looked at the scientists who were involved, that there was not much in the way of uh, diversity. And thus they felt that if they called for- so, Yeah, hold, hold on one, one second. If, if they called for a diverse team to be involved in the development of the science and the implementation of the science, that they might have you know, more uh, diversity in the end goal. So that's, that's what this is all about. Uh, I will say that Noni Burns, who's the director of the Center for Scientific Review that reviews the lion's share of grants for NIH, is a little dubious. Um, she's wondering whether a um, review panel that has a Nobel laureate who does beautiful science but doesn't really address this issue well or at all will end up with a lower score than a scientist who does a great job of addressing this and all other issues, but is not the Nobel laureate. And you know, only time will tell in terms of evaluating that. Is that helpful? You're muted, John, but I think it was helpful. <laughs> <laughs> okay, thank you. Um, and then finally- we'll come off we... mute to say, yes, that was very helpful. <laughs> Um, and then finally, we said in terms of things that are externally facing, that we would develop a sustainable process to gather and make public demographics of our internal and external workforce, you know, adhering to the concept that transparency can make a big difference. Um, uh, sunshine is the greatest antiseptic. So our Office of Extra Moral Research in the data book now has data about funded uh, researchers by race, ethnicity, disability status, as well as uh, gender and career stage, which had previously been there. And we have put our own data out there about our own workforce by race, ethnicity, and by career category. Um, and our staff are holding us accountable. Internally, we said we would implement policy changes to promote anti-racism and remove barriers to professional growth for our staff. And to that end, we established something that we're calling the Anti-Racism Steering Committee. It's currently 515 members strong. Uh, one of the benefits of meeting virtually rather than um, in person, uh, we said anyone who would be interested could join as was the case with the Anti-Harassment Steering Committee. So we have 515 members, 11 subcommittees. It's gonna be really fun seeing what comes from this group. This is representative of the demographics. We have a great variety by race, ethnicity, by work categorization, and by what's called GS level, which generally corresponds with pay, pay level. We said that we would develop a performance expectation for institute and center directors to be accountable for equity, diversity, and inclusion across NIH and their institute uh, by a diversity, equity, and inclusion officer or some other means that was appropriate in coordination with my office and the Office of Equity, Diversity, and Inclusion, which is basically the EEO office. And that is being put in place. We are now into fiscal 22. That's one of the performance uh, metrics for the student center directors. Uh, our team will be going before what's called a steering committee um, a week from Thursday to talk about a component of this, which will be development of racial equity plans for each of the institutes and centers. So um, we are um, aligning our values and our expectations in keeping with this being an important issue. And then we said we would expand the Distinguished Scholars Program to senior investigators hired with tenure uh, to enhance recruitment of researchers from underrepresented groups. So this gets to your question, John. The Distinguished Scholars Program is something that was developed under uh, Hannah's leadership. It's built upon something called the Statman and Lasker Investigator Program. So the Statman and Lasker programs are programs where people apply in response to the solicitation by a certain deadline. And it's a whole group of people as opposed to one-on-one -on -one recruitment that you might ordinarily do. Uh, and then they go through um, uh, a vetting process, two levels of review, and ultimately get matched to an institute or center based upon these the institutes and centers. What's being built upon this is this self-reinforcing community of principal investigators who are devoted to diversity and inclusion. When they're applying for these programs, they have to say what their interest is and what their track record is and the best of the best get selected. And what has been found as a result of this is that as opposed to the declining percentages of underrepresented minority uh, uh, tenure track scientists uh, between 1995 and 2010, from 2010 to about 2018, when the uh, Distinguished Scholars Program was started, 
Staten and Alaska had an impact, but it seems that the Distinguished Scholars Program had an even greater impact in helping to enhance the diversity of the tenure track program. As you can see, not everyone is visibly from an underrepresented minority group, and in fact, they're not. You simply have to have the interest in and the track record, although it's enriched in those individuals. Um, and it's important that these people meet on a monthly basis. They become a self-reinforcing um, community. They get extra mentoring from outstanding mentors like Francis Collins, it's extra money for their lab. Uh, and we are in the process of evaluating whether their presence uh, is having a beneficial impact on the uh, climates in the institutes from which they come. So that uh, ex expanding that to senior uh, distinguished scholars is underway. There, are, there's at least one recruitment that's uh, actively underway that's looking for a senior person to run a center as well as diversity, equity, and inclusion. That's the National Institute of Biomedical Engin Engineering and Biomedicine. Uh, there are a few others that are in the hopper. So on June 11th, we also talked about what we envisioned going forward, uh, and we said. First of all, that we were very grateful that President Biden had put forward uh, funding increases for the National Institute of Minority Health and Health Disparities, National Institute of Nursing Research, National Heart, Lung and Blood Institute, and the Fogarty International Institutes, because we felt that this would help facilitate health disparities, minority health and health equity research. Why is that? Because of this analysis that was led by Mike Lauer, director of our Office of Extramural Research and colleagues that looked at um, success rates for R01 equivalent grants by institute and center. Here's minority health, here's health, um, uh, uh, this is minority health, I guess. Uh, this is Fogarty International Institute, um, Heart Lung is someplace along here. Uh, the Nursing Institute is here. They have a lower success rate for R01 equivalent grants than other institutes and centers. And yet in their analysis, they found that 10% uh, of 148 topics accounted for 50% of applications submitted very specifically by African-American and Black uh, PIs addressing this gender gap. Um, these were funded at lower rates, but the peer review outcomes are similar, and the lower rate of funding was primarily due to their assignment to ICs with lower award rates, those ICs that I just mentioned to you. Um, so we're excited that that has been put forward by President Biden. I just saw from our ledge person that the appropriations bill supposedly is being dropped as of three o'clock this afternoon. So we will see uh, what is being put forward. We're currently in a, a continuing resolution. We're also encouraging all of the institutes and centers to develop um, disease and topic specific uh, solicitations and help disparities minority health and health equity. And I can tell you that there's a lot of work ongoing. You'll probably see several things coming out in the next several months. Uh, we're encouraging the development of programs to spur institutional culture change in support of inclusivity and equity. And this is the other bit of information I wanted to share, John, that helps to think about this cohort recruitment issue. Um, th there's this funding opportunity announcement through the Common Fund called the Faculty Institutional Recruitment for Sustainable Transformation Program, or FIRST. Um, the goal of this is to create cultures of inclusive excellence, very much modeled after what's being done with the Distinguished Scholars Program. So it's calling for academic research institutions outside of NIH to hire cohorts of faculty, uh, generally expected at least 10 or more over the course of two or three years, uh, provide multi-level mentoring, professional development, look at the institution and make sure that there's an institution-wide integrated system to address bias, faculty equity, mentoring and work-life issues, and there's a, a coordinating center. And the Common Fund uh, dollars are a little more than uh, 240 million over the next nine years. So the first of these uh, first <laughs> recipients were recently announced. Uh, you'll see, see a mix. Marie, I would suggest you change the title from the top line to the second line for this program. It would be more, I mean, we're off the slide now and you don't have to go back, but just think about whether the, I, I think having the title create cultures of inclusive excellence, that's the overarching goal. That would also be a great title for the program. Well taken. Thank you. So the first set of uh, cohorts were recently announced. Uh, we have a mixture of high resource, uh, low resource, um, the Tuskegee UAB um, 
application is a partnership. So we're very pleased with that. Um, the second uh, set of cohorts uh, applications are already in. Um, so review will be this fall and probably announcement early winter, uh, late winter. Um, and then there'll be a third solic solicitation for fiscal year 23. The coordinating center is going to be Morehouse School of Medicine. And the launch officially of these, uh, uh, the first convening of all of these grantees will be in a couple of weeks. So this is something for which you can stay tuned. Um, but I will say that that December 8th SWDSS that we're planning is to try to hopefully capture the energy and enthusiasm of people who have applied or who are thinking of applying for the first initiative, as well as other programs that are using the same sort of approach. There is the Mosaic program from NIH. Um, there are many, there's the um, Athena Swan program in the UK. There's the um, programs led by AAAS. We'd like to bring all those people together and begin thinking about you know, what are the uh, generalizable principles that all can use and what can we do to further enhance that enthusiasm. We're also encouraging all of the institutes and centers to join the National Institute of General Medical Sciences in uh, the Science Education Partnership Award that they lead that targets K through 12 STEM education, uh, a step towards making sure we have that pathway of future scientists well filled. Um, we're going to be looking at how our staff, our scientists, administrators, our scientific re review officers interact with applicants, recognizing that that can be really key in whether or not a person chooses to go forward with uh, funding. Uh, uh, opportunity applications and wanting to make sure there's not bias or inequity in the way that those interactions occur. Uh, we're going to be looking at developing more programs um, to interact with historic black colleges and universities, tribal colleges and universities, and other minority serving institutions. So I know I went very quickly with that, but I wanted to make sure to give you all the broad overview of what it is that we're envisioning. Um, I've had many a person say to me that they don't necessarily see themselves here. You know, they, um, what about intersectionality? What about, you know, if I'm not from a, a traditionally seen racial ethnic uh, minority group? And I am reminded of this uh, quote from the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King in his letter from a Birmingham jail where he states, injustice anywhere is a threat to justice everywhere. We are caught in an inescapable network of mutuality tied in a single garment of destiny. Whatever affects one directly affects all indirectly. And that's our philosophy here. What we are doing is we're stepping back, we're looking systematically at everything to try to make sure that our systems are equitable and fair, uh, and it should be beneficial to all. So we have our approach summarized in a commentary that came out in Cell on June 10th. There'll be another commentary led by Larry Tayback, Principal Deputy Director, Alfred Johnson, Deputy Director of Management, uh, Trevor Hopkins LaVoy, who's the Director, Acting Director of our Office of Equity, Diversity and Inclusion, and myself in Nature Medicine next month. It's the beginning of a um, diversity series that they have. And show things that are a little further along the line than uh, at the point of the cell commentary. So keep an eye out for that. You may recognize a couple of the illustrations there. And this is the group of 80 plus volunteers who have been involved intensively in this think tank since we, we were officially launched internally at uh, what's called the Institute and Center Directors Retreat in October of 2020, externally February of 26. And they've been working very hard to assess what's going on in the environment uh, and make thoughtful recommendations about how we should move forward. The only people who are truly paid to be here are Marge Esther, who's a program support person, Victoria Rucker, the program manager. As I said, I'm very honored to co-chair this with Larry Tayback, the principal de deputy director, and Alfred Johnson, the deputy director for management. We're bringing in other resources as needed, contractors, et cetera, to make things go forward. But the thing that is valuable from our viewpoint here is that it is our own staff and their thoughts and um, volunteer time that's moving forward the thought. 
So I'll close with this favorite adage from the Cosmet office, great minds think differently. And then I'd be really interested in additional questions you guys might have about what I've shared here. Thank you very much. That was a wonderful presentation. I'm sure there are lots of questions. Does anybody want to start? I'll, I'll kick it John, off. John, you're uh, muted if you're, I think, John? Yeah, what is your personal sense, Marie? I'm sorry, I'm slow to get to the button <laughs> of, of how the program is doing. You've given some objective measures, but um, from your own personal perspective, if you allow me to ask you that, how do you think the program is doing? Are we on the right track? It may be going slower than you like, but are we on the right track? Or, uh, in I will say that I am just really delighted to see the direction that we're going. Um, as I was saying to someone earlier, everything is aligned. And we have an administration that has multiple diversity, equity, and inclusion, diversity, equity, inclusion, and accessibility executive orders for us to respond to. We have the leadership at NIH that's fully aligned in this direction. And we have people recognizing that this is an important thing to address. Um, yes, it's, we have a big organization. It takes a long time to move a big organization. But as it gets going, the momentum is, is tremendous. Um, and, People who've been at NIH for 20, 30, 40 years say they've never seen it like this. Um, people who are outside of NIH say, I can't believe you guys are actually addressing this. It used to be a day that you couldn't even say the word racism um, in an application. So I think everything is going in the right direction. Of course, there's, there's the worry. Francis Collins has officially announced that he is stepping down at the end of this year. But uh, anyone who gets appointed as NIH director or nominated as NIH director by the Biden administration will presumably be very much aligned in a similar fashion. And again, there's a lot of momentum going. There's a lot of focus on this and recognition that this is important and uh, needs to be part of our fiber. So I'm very excited uh, and feel very privileged to be involved at this time. Excellent. So I want to just jump in with a, a couple of observations and, and also questions. I think the thing that's really tremendously exciting, as you pointed out, is that this is comprehensive and it's, and it's well aligned. Um, there's also the problem, though, as you said, that it's, it always has a little bit of vulnerability because funding is, is year to year and the directors change, uh, you know, NIH director and also directors of the various institutes. And, and so there can always be some uncertainty. So I wonder, and you've already, and you've started reaching out to institutions outside of NIH to reinforce a lot of what you're doing. And so I wonder whether there's, there's plans to do that even more. Um, and particularly, I wonder whether you are reaching out to um, HHMI, um, the Howard Hughes Medical Institute, because as you know, they, they just announced a $2 billion commitment to diversity and have a lot of the same um, initiatives uh, that, that you do. And they're, they have the advantage of uh, having you know, tentacles into a lot of the same institutions that that NIH does. So I wonder if you're reaching out to programs and institutes like that, and um, and particularly whether you're reaching out to, to HHMI in particular. Thank you for that question, Risa. Yes, I just talked to my good buddy from HHMI, who used, I used to have uh, coffee with her once a quarter when we could meet in person, and I said, okay, so what's up, you know? Can we get together and talk about this? Um, because yes, they've had a long-term interest in this area. Uh, there's been a lot of conversation in the past, but not a lot of conversation lately. And so my job is to get that going again and to see where there are opportunities for us to partner and collaborate. And my job is as well to look at other agencies and entities. There are things going on at NSF. There are things going on at AAAS. There are things going on across the department. 
Um, so we are, we are working on all of that. There are some things that are really unique to us, of course, that we have to do. Um, but uh, again, it's kind of the exciting time because there are others who are doing similar things and who are interested in working together. Uh, there are even people in pharma who are doing these sorts of things. And um, I've been having conversations with some of those people to at least compare agendas and, and see where we might be able to leverage each other. So yeah, it's, it's a great time. I have a question. So you mentioned at the very beginning some of the benefits of getting uh, diverse individuals to work together in groups, um, you know, more facts, fewer errors, et cetera, et cetera. And that makes a lot of sense, I think. And I'm just wondering if there are any particular challenges or difficulties in those sorts of settings, you know, that we need to look out for to try to optimize the benefits of those kinds of interactions. I think the literature demonstrates, and I can just give you the anecdotal uh, example of what we found with NIH Unite. Um, 80 plus people, we have people from lots of different job categorizations, career stages, uh, personal backgrounds, and getting everyone to be kind of speaking the same language. It was, took some time. It was like a Tower of Babel initially. <laughs> um, and then there are the issues of power dynamics and making sure that everyone's voice is heard and that that's, you know, sometimes people who are accustomed to being the person in charge need to be reminded that that's not necessarily the way that things work with the current team. But those of us in aging research and geriatrics are very familiar with that and accustomed to that. Um, so yeah, getting, getting everyone together. And again, it goes to that African proverb. We're gonna go far because we have a lot of folks, but it's not gonna be fast. It takes a while uh -huh. to really gel those teams. Far is better in the end, so that's good. Yes. We have some other, other questions from the group. Let me raise another issue that, um, you know, I said I was sort of toggling back and forth between two meetings and the, the National Academy of Medicine is meeting now and uh, appropriately is dealing with some of the same topics. One of the things that has come up is the, the bias, if you will, that we have in um, pulling together teams to do science in a way that rewards the members of the team in a way that um, continues to encourage that kind of collaboration. And you know, the examples that were brought forth were the incredible collaboration that happened um, in response to COVID and uh, different types of science being done across uh, incredible platforms at unprecedented speed. And yet that being something that is not usually rewarded in um, the way that we reward science um, through the funding process and so on. And so that kind of comes back to, um, to, to you all and, uh, and particularly to some of the, the kinds of topics that tend to get relegated to uh, institutes that maybe don't have as much funding. And therefore, there's a systemic bias against them. So I'm wondering whether any of those issues came up. I mean, you, you, you're addressing the funding part, but what about the ways in which, if you're going to address um, racism in medicine and understand some of the, um, the, the changes that need to be made, if that's one of the pursuits that you're taking, the kind of scientists that you need to work with um, is pretty diverse relative to um, a traditional team. And certainly if you're gonna do that in older folks, it probably gets even more complex. So have any of those issues come up in the task force and uh, thoughts on how NIH might address them? 
Yes, that is a really tough question that we're struggling with in terms of making sure that you have um, that diversity of the team and rewarding those people who are bringing diversity to the team, uh, recognizing that they get pulled in lots of different directions and, um, you know, Hope, hopefully not structuring things in such a way that they get pulled this, that, or another way. So their name is on something, but they're not participating in a meaningful fashion. Uh, one of the things that comes up is, should there be some sort of separate way of recognizing people who bring uh, diversity or focus on diversity above and beyond something like a first award? You know, should there be something that recognizes individuals in that fashion? Um, will there be an impact of the plans to enhance diverse perspectives that will address that issue? Um, and if so, how? So we're still struggling with that, recognizing that those are really important issues, not going to be fully addressed by giving more money to uh, institutes that um, have low, fund, low success rates for health disparities type research, but no definitive answers as yet. Looks like Shana turned her camera on. Dr. Bernard, it's very nice. To, it's nice to see you again. Uh, one of the last times we ran into each other was at the uh, Butler Williams Institute, and an, and a hot topic uh, that came up a lot during that institute was related to the peer review process. Mm -hmm. And I wanted to know from all the initiatives that you, the wonderful initiatives you were speaking to today. Is there anything that's going on that addresses some of the issues we brought up or that were being discussed related to the peer review process for grants? Yes, there's a lot that's going on along the lines of peer review. And it's, it's been since taking on this role, the opportunity to get to know Noni Burns, who leads the Center for Scientific Review, and hear much more clearly what they're doing has been um, really uh, edifying. So yes, 80% or more grants that get reviewed at NIH or are reviewed in the Center for Scientific Review. Then there's 20% that are done at the individual institutes and centers. And sometimes the things that people run into as problems are done at the institute level rather than the CSR level, even though theoretically the approaches should all be the same, but I, I, I give you that caveat to begin with. Uh, at the CSR level, um, they're doing several things. Uh, first of all, they are being transparent about the demographics of their scientific review officers and of their review panels. Um, and they've seen just by adding that transparency that um, people have been more thoughtful, there's, there's, their SROs have been more thoughtful about who they bring into the panels. And they actually, as compared to representation in the scientific workforce have more uh, of uh, individuals from underrepresented racial ethnic groups than would be anticipated. That's, that's not a lot unfortunately, because those, those numbers are relatively small proportionally. They're also um, making sure now that there's implicit bias training for all scientific review officers and all peer review panels. Um, they're also experimenting with anonymization of grants. Um, they did it, they did one tranche where it was a, a after the fact anonymization and discovered that the review panel was pretty much able to guess in many cases where the application came from. So they have a prospective evaluation um, that be just about completed this point, which was already a two-stage process where first the science is submitted and then you add in the institution and the individual. Um, I don't know the results of that yet, but they're, they're looking at whether that sort of two-step evaluation made for a difference in outcomes for the applications. And they're looking in general at um, what their review criteria should be going forward. Should, should it be a different process where you are able to look at the science separate from environment and individual? Um, not sure where that will go, but they're, they're examining all of those things. Thank you for that excellent response. Any other questions from the group? Okay, 
I guess we'll we'll end things there. Thanks you very much, Dr. Bernard. That that was a really interesting discussion and uh, and presentation. Thank you so much. Take care, everybody.